It has started yet again. I suppose I'm going to continue. So, close this door. All right, you can name a lot of things. One thing I didn't teach you yet. So, first of all, remember that mono die tri tetra thing? Well, I'm going to tell you something. All right, CUSO4.5H2O. dot five H two O. I will heat it up with this delta because deltas are just so warm they are. That means heat, and I'll make CUSO4 plus five H two O's that will fly away as a gas because it's heat. This is a dry blue solid. This is a dry white solid. So first, I want to name CUSO4. It's copper. Okay. SO4, more than one type of atom is an anion. Look it up on my little table of polyatomics. It's a sulfate. And then I say, is copper a 1A, 2A aluminum, zinc, or silver? It is not, therefore it needs a Roman numeral. Sulfate is a minus 2. There are not, well, you think there are, there are not four sulfates here. Because remember, what's a sulfate? Sulfate is this wild species. Floats around. There are four of these. No, there's only one of those. So minus two times one is minus two up to the next plus two divided by one. So that's a plus two copper. This is copper two sulfate. No question about it. But this is copper two sulfate and it's blue. And this is copper two sulfate and it's white. If I take a rock of this type of copper two sulfate, it weigh and weigh it for a certain amount of weight and heat it up, it will drive off waters that are internal inside of the actual crystal lattice. We say these are five waters of hydration. It'll drive off the five waters of hydration and they fly away as a gas. And this will leave you, since it's the salt of sulfuric acid, the anhydrous salt. So this species is called a hydrate, but there are many different hydrates. How do you name it? Well, you just use that di-tri system that I use for a mono di-tri for carbon dioxide, etc. You say pentahydrate. So this is copper two sulfate pentahydrate. So if I said write the formula of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, ignore this for a moment. Copper 2, Cu plus 2, sulfate, SO4 minus 2. You can cross it down, but they balance each other. So you write CuSO4. And then for pentahydrate, 5, like the Pentagon, 5 waters, dot 5H2O. So that takes care of me talking about hydrates. Something else I want to talk about because I know exactly what I'm going to give you for old exams to look at. F E plus three is iron three. F E plus two is iron two. Iron is not something that starts with an F and an E. It comes from another language. So in the old days, Fe plus 3 was called the ferric ion. And Fe plus 2 was called the ferrous ion. So if I had iron 3 chloride, I write Fe plus 3, the Roman numeral tells me to charge it to iron. And then I write Cl minus 1, cross it down, 
FeCl3, because some Latin is just not going away. Like if you have a metal detector, you set it on non-ferrous metals trying to get gold and things like that. Um, if I said to you ferric chloride, I would never say ferric three chloride. Ferric means iron three. Ferric means Fe plus three. Chloride's a minus one, FeCl3. So there's some Latin that's not going to go away and I can't get rid of. I'll write the rest of them. Cu plus two, copper two. Cu plus one, copper one. Erasing this. Copper two was called cupric. Copper one is the cuprous ion. Cupric ion, the cuprous ion. This is important. Iron two is ferrous. Copper two is cupric. So the IC is not only going to go with plus twos. But the IC is always a higher number than the OUS. Yeah, probably you're thinking I just made this all up. I always thought it'd be interesting if I made a class up and invented my own science and this taught it and then no one ever told them it was wrong. But this does seem obscure. This is just years and years of mankind or humankind learning stuff. PB plus four, PB plus two. Okay, why is it not a three? Well, it's a long story. There's something to do with the six shell and these orbitals of P's and S's being uniquely stable. Below lead is tin, Sn plus two, four, Sn plus two. So this is lead four, and this is lead two. But lead is used for pipes. I had my other students smelt lead. I had to make little bullets in the lab to it. It was really a hot fire that I had to use. But either way, so lead is used for making bullets, et cetera, but it's also used for pipes. Lead pipes are used in plumbing. That's where the PV comes from. But this is plumb thick. And this is plumb bus. Once again, the ick is going to be the higher oxidation state, the higher charge. This is tin four. This is tin two. So this is static. And this is stannous. Fluoride is used for making your teeth a lot less soluble, thousands of times less soluble. If you look on, uh, I suppose, your toothpaste, it'll say if it has fluoride, it'll say it has stannous fluoride. It means stannous fluoride would mean Sn plus two, fluoride would be minus one, SnF2. So it contains stannous fluoride. If it contains stannic fluoride, it'd be SnF4. That takes care of naming for a while. Now, I'm going to look at my sheet of other things I told those students. Okay, here we go. Because you want to hear the same stuff, you pay the same money. All right. This is water, HOH. Let's write it this way. Just for fun. Water could be thought of as H plus getting with OH minus. H plus is the proton. OH minus is the other side of water. It's one of our polyatomics. I look at our little polyatomic sheet and OH minus is called hydroxide. So when the proton reacts with a hydroxide, it neutralizes to make water. The word neutralizes is going to be important. So there's something that you will deal with in life and you'll deal with in this class, but you'll definitely deal with in life. There's something called the pH scale. It's
it's an old logarithmic scale. A log makes really big numbers and really small numbers into friendly little numbers we can all follow. Okay, so people should know their pH scale. Zero to seven to 14. Zero to seven is acidic, which means extra H plus. Seven to 14 is basic which means extra OH minus, because our world is based on water. The two sides of water can neutralize each other to make pH 7 neutral. Now, looking at this, what do we know about acids? Well, they're sour. And let's see, they neutralize with Bases. Acids neutralize with bases. What is a base? The other side of water. NaOH. If you see an OH minus, there's going to be another type of base that makes OH minus in water. But if you see an OH minus, you're a base. If you see an H first, you're an acid. But this is just regular naming sodium hydroxide. This was called lye. This is the major ingredient in Drano to clean your pipes because bases react with animal fat. So bases react with animal fat or any fat really to make soap. And that might seem like a friendly thing, but I consider bases to be more dangerous than acids. If I put my hand in hydrochloric acid, I'm going to take my hand away and say, oh my God, that hurts, let me wash that off. If I play with a pellet of drain cleaner, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, if I play with a pellet, my skin is going to get very slippery. And it's a little bit of fun for a moment. When I wash my hand, because there was animal fat in my hand, I've got a huge burn on my hand. So you don't know that you're getting burned. So I think these are actually more dangerous. Why do we need this? Oh my God, so much of your life is greasy. You're trying to get rid of grease. So if you think about it, um, if you clean your drains and they have like animal fat in them, you can clean it out that way. If you have like, um, a clean it in an oven. It's a spray. That's why the oven cleaners are so dangerous. It's a spray bottle of Drano. You got that in your eyes, you blind yourself in a second. But what do you do? You're cleaning the grease off the inside of the oven. Everybody cooks these days because of all the cooking channel chefs. We really like those. So, acids neutralize with a base. The bases neutralize with an acid. And they have extra OH minus. Now, acids are sour, but I wouldn't eat hydrochloric acid, but vinegar, you can eat vinegar, and it tastes kind of sour. Citric acid for lemons and things like that. Well, this right here, basic hydroxides, these taste bitter. All your bitter herbs are going to be basic in solution, if you're wondering. You wouldn't eat sodium hydroxide, though. So that's a little bit of acid-based chemistry, except for one thing. As chemists, when we want to test, we take a piece of paper, it's called litmus paper, and blue paper, litmus paper, turns red in acid. And red litmus paper turns blue in base. Acids are often written with a red color. Bases are often written with a blue color. The blue and the red neutralize each other. Why is this important? Well, I mean, I want you to know that litmus paper, that blue litmus paper turns red in an acid and red litmus paper turns blue in a base. But litmus is used during political years because litmus can only tell you if it's acidic or basic. It doesn't tell you the exact pH. It's an on-off yes or no test. 
they use that in politics a lot. So if you're trying to elect someone who's president, uh, we have a very strange thing in this country. We have um, a Supreme Court ruling, but not a law. OK, so right now, abortion is legal because of the Supreme Court ruling in the early 1970s, Roe versus Wade. Normally, when we have a law, people pass it and then it becomes the law of the land or it's going to be a law for one state, a different law for another state. But Roe versus Wade is a decision. What's interesting about that is you have a Supreme Court and a Supreme Court before Roe versus Wade before the whole abortion debate, et cetera, people would get that appointment for life, but they'd retire, okay? Now, if you have a Republican, normally the Republican's going to be pro-life, and they're gonna only put Supreme Court justices who are pro-life, normally. If you have a Democrat, quite often, a Democrat's gonna be pro-choice, but not always, and they would put a pro-choice person in there. And if you put enough on one side or the other, you can overturn a law. But what it does in practicality is you could have a 95-year-old justice who has cancer who's not allowed to retire because if it's a Republican president and it's a 95-year-old justice who's a Democrat, that, pre that poor person or whoever works for him who's doing the decisions by that point, uh, that person is going to be in a situation where they say, geez, if I retire now, let me wait until there's a Democrat in office. And I think that's kind of cruel. It's like elder abuse. I mean, we have 97 year old people supposedly making decisions for us, and I'm not really sure they're reading all of those documents. Maybe they are. I've got a 91 year old uncle, and he seems to be quite lucid, okay? But either way, they always talk during debates and they say, Mr. Uh, Mr. So and so, you're running for president. Do you have a litmus test? And for Supreme Court justice, and they always answer, I'm going to pick somebody with the best judicial character based on all their decisions. But they might have a test that says, no, I'm not going to take pro-choice. So no, I'm not going to take pro-life. And I think it's cruel to the elderly people who work in the Supreme Court. That's just my feeling. I have no opinion on uh, abortion at all, if you notice my feelings. There's no reason to have an opinion. But I do hate the fact that they've taken a chemistry term and they use it to abuse the elderly. So let's leave that alone. pH scale is done. But I have other things to tell you. You're probably like, what can you possibly teach me now? Okay, what is everything? You've been taking too much for granted about what stuff is. Now we're gonna tell you what all the stuff is. So, first of all, we know our air is 80% N2 and 20% O2. I think people should know that. If you go underwater, Rooms of air are condensed all the way down to a liquid. And you put them on your back and you just go underwater and it's a great experience for you and you breathe in actual air, okay? You don't go underwater with just oxygen. So, but what is everything else? Well, let's see. Rocks can be smelted to make pure P-U-R-E, metals. So iron ore is a rock. You heat it up in the presence of carbon and you can make steel, which is really pure. The most abundant metal on the earth, I said, is aluminum by far, but that's all stuck in Kentucky red clay and other types of clay. Getting past that, C-A-C-O-3. If I said name that, CaCO3 calcium carbonate not calcium 2 carbonate because it's a 2A element, this is called limestone. But it's also seashells. It's also coral. A whole coral reef is going to be limestone. It's also marble. If you have a marble statue, calcium carbonate reacts with acid for acid rain and it degrades and it gets all, well, it starts to give off gas and it becomes like pitted a lot of times, okay? But if you take calcium carbonate and you mix it with clay,
you can make cement. So what is stuff? Well, this piece of uh, metal here is pure aluminum. That comes from an aluminum oxide or some sort of a rock, OK? There are a couple noble metals. Like I said before, this is gold. You can find gold in a zero charge in nature, and you can find silver pure in nature. But aside from that, you find it in a rock form. Well, what is this stuff down here? Oh, good, I have a little bit of a view here. That's rock. It's not paper, it's not scissors. What is rock? Rock is uh, stuff that's outside, it's metals with anions. So you could have carbonate rocks. You could have sulfide rocks. Calcium sulfide would be a rock, or iron oxide would be an ore of iron. So you have rocks and then you have pure metals. And then something else, let's see. Chains of glucose sugars. Bonded one way are starch. All right, chains of, you can explain what everything is around it. So chains of glucose sugars bonded one way of starch, bonded another way are cellulose. So wood, paper, and by the way, these are polar. How do you know paper is polar? If I take this sheet of paper and put it in water, the water runs up. If it was nonpolar, which I'll get to pretty quickly, the water would stay away from it. Like you wax your car with nonpolar wax and water beads up and hates it. It's trying to get away. Well, it loves this stuff because this is glucose sugar. You could eat it, it would just be fiber, okay? So piece of all, all the wood you see on these doors, that's nothing but sugar. What can eat that? Uh, well, something that can break down the chain and it's only termites because they use some sort of a symbiotic relationship with some sort of a protozoa or something. But either way, getting past that, what is everything? You have air, you have rocks that you make stuff from, right? And you can make cement. Let's see what else. Sand makes glass. When I was a kid in the 1970s and you went to the store, boy, everything was so heavy. All the bottles of soda would be glass. Today, they're not. What is everything else in this room? Okay, because we figured out glass, we figured out anything made of paper or wood, and we figured out everything else is made of rock. Then there's this big topic, fossil fuels. And they're pretty much everything else. So let's explain fossil fuels being everything else. First of all, I feel bad for the name. Because if somebody says what fossil fuels are, you say coal, which you can burn to make electricity. And in Kentucky, I'm sure we still burn some coal to make electricity. Doesn't burn very cleanly. Then you have natural gas. And that's just CH4. We're going to do a lot with that. This burns very cleanly. OK, so if you have natural gas, that's a Bunsen burner. Or this is what heats your home quite often. OK, coal can be used to make electricity, natural gas, a little bit different. Then you have uh, petroleum. And I want to spend some time on petroleum. Here's a barrel of crude oil. All three of these are fossil fuels. But I feel bad for that name. Because when somebody says, where's a fossil fuel from? Everybody seems to say dinosaurs. OK, a little bit of coal might be from dinosaurs, but it's mostly giant amounts of forest. OK, so anyway, if you break down all the glucose in the wood, it becomes nothing but pure carbon at some point with other things in it. So there's a little bit of dinosaurs in there. You could be fossil fuel at some point. But crude oil. We live in Kentucky. We distill alcohol from fermented fruits. What does it mean to distill? Well, if you had 
some apple cider and it went bad. It would produce some alcohol, which you could get drunk on. But if you drank enough to get drunk, you'd have horrible stomach problems. So what we do is we distill it. Alcohol, the one I'll talk about soon, will be called ethanol, boils at 78 degrees Celsius and water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So if you have a solution that's alcohol and water and you boil and distill off the stuff that boils low, you can get a much stronger bourbon or whiskey or anything you want to make. That's a big thing. You see those moonshine. Um, what do we see? We see moonshine uh, TV shows where they pretend that nobody knows they're out there in the woods and they're making this stuff. If you, if you really saw this, if you saw like a tractor going in a field that's on blocks, somebody might be doing a distillation apparatus. So you can separate liquids by boiling point. Back to petroleum. So you take a barrel of petroleum, crude oil. We just had a storm in the Gulf of Mexico. And the price of gasoline goes up because we might have a lot of crude oil, but we don't have a refinery that's running. So if we talked about boiling points, because we're still doing what is everything. So this will be low boiling points. This will be high boiling points. If we talked about low boiling points and we talked about high boiling points, the lowest fraction, many different types of molecules, these are all going to be hydrocarbons. Chains of hydrogen and carbon. The simplest hydrocarbon is natural gas CH4 but you can have many of them in a chain. So the simplest fraction is CH4. So the lowest one would be like gasoline. You boil off your gasoline, the lightest one, but there's still a lot of stuff in the barrel that are heavier, longer chains. Higher boiling after you get rid of these, kerosene, jet fuel. You might have seen a kerosene heater. If you use a kerosene heater inside of a house, it's not that clean because it's a heavier oil. Lamp oil, they might call that stuff at some point. Then on top of kerosene, oh, I don't know, the motor oils. They're separated by how heavy they are, the weight. 10W40 if you go to AutoZone and you just like to like buy things from AutoZone and put it in your car and stuff like that. If you have a combustion engine, then you'll have, let's see, heavy oils. And then finally, if you heat it as much as you could and look in the barrel, and the stuff that could come off and be caught has been caught already, you probably have some goo here. You wouldn't think it would be beautiful and clean. The goo would be the asphaltics, tar. So what can you do with petroleum? You can use it to fuel things. But if we run out of petroleum, your roads are made from this asphaltic stuff. The tar on your roof is made from asphaltic stuff. Now, it's kind of a sin that we even burn this stuff. And not because of global warming or one thing or the other, because it's a great raw material. Petroleum can be made into plastics. So what is stuff? This thing, whatever this is, this coating, it's definitely not going to like water. This is Saudi Arabian oil. Um, this pen in my hand, this is Saudi Arabian oil, or it's whoever's oil, the lightest oil on this world, the cheapest oil on this world. It would be Saudi Arabia, Libya, until America uh, bombed Libya. It was, uh, doing, it was doing a lot of the cheapest oil because they could get it out of the ground for $30 a barrel, and when it's selling for $60, they are in good shape. If you get oil offshore, it takes you $80 a barrel to get it out of the ground, but if it's selling for $60, it doesn't do anyone any good. 
sometimes the price of oil goes negative and then the whole city just goes belly up, like in um, some of the northern states. But anyway, you can make it into plastics. This thing right here, Saudi Arabian oil. Um, your clothes. Your clothes can be cotton, which would be glucose. And that's why moths would eat your clothes in the old days, and you would have to have mothballs to get rid of them, moth-eating clothes. But most of your clothes now are polyester. There's not enough cotton and wool from sheep to uh, clothe everybody. You're all wearing Saudi Arabian oil. If you notice, you have to iron cotton. I iron my shirts every day, okay? I ironed 15 shirts two days ago, so I'm pretty happy about that. Lots of starch. Why do you spray starch? Well, you're spraying glucose. It rebuilds the shirt, if you're wondering. Anyway, so uh, to make a long story short, so many things in this room, my eyeglasses, they're not really heavy glass because they're made of Saudi Arabian oil. So everything, so let's just roll something in here. This chair, there's, there's not a plant in the world that makes this chair. Oh, you wanna see the chair? Okay. Here's the chair, get up a little bit higher. Here is the chair, the bottom of it, Saudi Arabian oil. So I want you to know what everything is, and I hope, it, I think you could tell what everything is right now. You could say like, well, what's your cell phone? A lot of plastic, so it's Saudi Arabian oil, some metals, and then some rare earth elements, et cetera. But I want you to know what stuff is. So let's continue. Uh, well, there's stuff that we really want to know. Curious. There's stuff that we really want to know about these nonpolar molecules. First of all, if you have a carbon to a carbon to a carbon, four bonds each to hydrogens, this is such an even pull in all directions. It's going to be nonpolar. This is completely nonpolar. This is still a gas. It's very small, but the longer you get, you start having things like gasoline, you start having like longer chain things, but they're not going to mix with water, they're nonpolar. If I gave you a little square marshmallow and I said, stick four sticks into it as far from each other as possible, you would come up with some sort of a shape like this. And you'd come up with a 109.5 degree angle. The reason I mention that is carbon chains aren't straight. Carbon chains go up and down. Like this. Up and down, up and down, up and down. If you've ever seen someone draw in biology a cell wall, it looks like they're drawing a little ghost. They're drawing carbon chains. If your son or daughter is taking sixth grade biology and they talk about what a cell looks like, it looks like a strange thing like this. These are just carbon chains going up and down. But these are nonpolar. With that in mind, people do want to be able to name some of these things. The prefix for organic naming is a little different. It's based on the number of carbons. So you have prefix of meth. That means one carbon, like CH4 is methane. Here's a carbon bonded to another carbon, so there's three spots for hydrogens. Two spots for hydrogens. Two spots for hydrogens. Two spots for hydrogens. Three spots for hydrogens. That's a one carbon. This is five carbons. Ain means single bonds. This is pent ain. You know a lot of these names already. So, meth is the prefix for one carbon. Two carbons is not di, it's f. So, C H3, CH3 is f ain. We draw him. Now you gotta put two carbons together, and then you'll have space for this.
the end ones get three hydrogens, the center ones get two, by itself it gets all four. The third one you know, you bought, probe, not tried, probe. So CH3, CH2, CH3 is propane. It's still a gas. So that would be CH3, then a CH2 in the center, then a CH3. I've condensed it, CH3 here, CH2 here, CH3. Like if I condense pentane, CH3, CH2, 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 I could say CH2 three times somehow, CH3. The fourth one you know too, butte. So CH3 brackets, CH2 two times, CH3 is butane. The fifth one, pentane. That would be CH3, CH2 repeated three times, CH3, pentane. Then the other head of ones you'd have for six carbons would be hexane, then heptane, then octane, then nonane, then decane. But I want to make a point as you know these. CH4, natural gas, heats your house if you live in a city and you have a gas line. Propane, if I had my class here, I'd say, where do you buy propane? And yesterday they said, the gas station. And why do you buy propane? Because it burns and you can use a propane grill. And those propane grills are beautiful, but the sparker goes out, so you have to light it with a match because you don't want to throw the grill away just because you don't want to get a new electronic sparker. And people hurt themselves so badly because you light the match first, then you turn the gas on. I know it's really hard, but they get this big ball of gas there, and they're jumping back, and hopefully they live. So propane. If you notice, you buy it from Thornton's in these metal canisters. Just like rooms of air can, can be condensed to liquid air, but you breathe it when you put it on your back and you go underwater. When you have propane, if you want to see if that can is full, you shake it, you hear the liquid inside of it. But if you turn it on, the gas comes out. Then butane, nobody said this one yesterday, which makes me feel that people don't smoke as much as they used to. But we used to say butane lighters. If you see a plastic butane lighter, you see a liquid in there, you can kind of, like if you're drinking and you're at a bar, you can kind of like put this in the light and watch the liquid and try to even up the levels. If you notice, propane has to be in metal. But when you get four carbons, you're almost a liquid. And that is a little bit of compression. You could do it in plastic, but when you turn it on, you hear gas coming out. Then pentane is actually a liquid, but it's actually going to be very volatile. Pour it on the table, it's going to disappear very quickly. It burns, but volatile means evaporates quickly in chemistry. Hexane, heptane, octane. If you buy gasoline, when you buy a fraction that burns at a certain or has a certain set of boiling points from petroleum, if you buy your gasoline, you have to make a decision if you're buying gasoline, which one of the buttons you press. I press the highest one because I got here and I got here in 97. I have a 97 Ford Taurus. 200 quarter million miles, I'm going to drive it until the day I die. But this Ford Taurus, um, I press the highest octane rating. It doesn't mean that it's 97% pure octane, that would cost a fortune. It means that it burns with the same heat output as 97% pure octane. And you guys with fancier cars, you buy the lower one, 84, you spend less money. If I buy the lowest one with my poor little six cylinder car, it's very exciting when I get to like, um, oh, I suppose a stoplight and it's, I got to keep playing with the gasoline to keep it going. But it makes driving more fun that way. So one more thing I want to show you and then I'll let you go, I promise. 
I said to you, this is really interesting. You'd be like, oh my God, I've waited this whole time for this one thing. I said NaOH is sodium hydroxide. Well, if you have a carbon, and instead of having four hydrogens, you had four hydrogens, but you had an OH, that's no longer a hydroxide. This is called an alcohol. One carbon, meth, and all. Wood alcohol. Two tablespoons of Killian. Don't drink wood alcohol. Then, if I had two carbons, and then an O, I mean, then a C with two hydrogens and an OH, this is no longer just ethane. This is F and all. This is what you call drinking alcohol. This is what the fruit ferments to, and that boils at 78 degrees. This is drinking alcohol. When you drink too much, you get drunk, and then you get a hangover because your body converts ethanol to something called acetaldehyde, I'm not doing biochemistry, and that's the hangover molecule. Your body converts ethanol to acetaldehyde, but you see, OH reacts the same way. OH is called a functional group. Over here, if your body gets two tablespoons of methanol, the problem, oh, METH, sorry about that. The problem is it looks a lot like ethanol. Your body says, I'm going to try to make acetaldehyde. It makes formaldehyde, the embalming fluid for dead people. So you die pretty quickly with one. Now, I want to make a point about alcohols. That'll be the last thing I do, I promise. I've got this all timed out really well. Here. C H H H C H C. Now instead of putting the OH at the end, which I could to make propanol, I'm gonna put it in the middle to make like an I. This is called isopropanol or isopropyl alcohol. Where this is ethyl alcohol. And rubbing alcohol can be isopropyl. Or it can be ethyl alcohol. If it's made from petroleum and you buy a bottle of rubbing alcohol, you might spend 89 cents at Walmart, or else it'll be a dollar fifteen or more. 89 cents. They smell a little bit different, but they're both going to do their job. Now. Why are they called rubbing alcohol? Well, when you get an infection, you get a fever. And we didn't always have ways of cooling children down with fever. If I pour alcohol on my hand and I say, oh my God, I hate having alcohol on my hand. I'm going to go to the bathroom and wash it off. By the time I get to the wash bathroom, it's gone. And my hand feels cold because it's so volatile, it steals heat from my hand to fly away. That's why you feel cold. You walk out of the shower, you feel cold, but it really would feel cold with this. You rub it on the kid, when you rub it on the child with a fever a long time ago, that's how they did it. There's other ways to cool down people with fevers now, and there's drugs you can give them. But you rub them uh, with this stuff, and it would cool the temperature down because you don't want a fever too high. A fever is good to kill some things, but too high is too high. If they're both made from petroleum, they're 89 cents. If you buy the exact same ethyl alcohol, but you buy it fermented, I don't know, like Everclear in a liquor store, it might be like, I don't know, $15. It's the exact same molecule as the ethyl rubbing alcohol. But you can't drink the ethyl rubbing alcohol because all governments on this planet, as much as we fight with each other, have poisoned this one. They want to protect the farmers. That's a good reason to do that. 
okay? In chemistry, we can get really cheap alcohol that isn't poisoned, but we have to like write all these things for the government saying how many bottles so we don't like to have somebody steal it before a party or something. OK, but it, there's always like a, one year it's a bunch of Ukrainian soldiers. They went to the ph pharmacy. They said, oh, this one's ethyl alcohol. Let's drink it. They got drunk and they died because they put the poison in there. So I think people should probably understand that ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol are both rubbing alcohols you can buy. And that ethyl alcohol, if it comes from a plant, is the one you drink. And I think that's got to be enough. So um, I'm going to put up problems and homework or opportunities probably on Friday, which means tomorrow, whenever you're watching this. And uh, then you'll have something to do this weekend. And the following weekend, there'll be the exam. Thank you for your time. You're all great. Everybody's proud of you. How's that? Yay. Okay, good. Uh, stop recording.